in listen-only mode. Welcome, everybody, to the Hump Day Coffee Break every Wednesday at 3 o'clock, at 11 o'clock, sorry. It, it is 3 o'clock somewhere. Um, and I have a special guest uh, that I'll introduce in just a second, Rachel. Um, but before we jump in, I want to just point out a few housekeeping tips. Uh, the format is pretty straightforward. It's a 15-minute presentation. Today's going to be a little bit different because Rachel has a lot to cover. And then we're going to finish at 1130 definitely take notes. Uh, the slides are actually available right now in GoToWebinar. So there's a handout feature. If you just click on the link, you can download the slides and you're off to the races. And then the uh, recording will be available through uh, the newsletter next Tuesday. Okay. Uh, and so in addition to the, um, the slides that you can download, you'll notice that the third page in the slides is actually a kind of a note sheet or a worksheet that you can use during this webinar. If you can't run over to your printer and print this out, that's fine. Just grab a piece of paper, write notes on one side and action items on the other. And the reason why I say this is because, you know, you want to take notes that'll, that'll kind of further the learning that you're going to to be doing. And also your organization is very unique. And many of the uh, suggestions that Rachel has would, will apply to you others may not apply to you. So you want to make note of those and definitely write down action items that you're going to do very soon. Okay. So uh, a good friend of mine, Rachel Muir, she's in uh, Austin, right, Rachel? Yep. You're in Austin. And uh, so she is an expert. Uh, she actually uh, had her own uh, nonprofit that she founded. It's still around called Girl Start that really helps girls embrace math and embrace their brain. Uh, and she's the VP of training for Pur Pursuant, and she's been featured on Oprah. That's all we need to say, Oprah. <laughs> and that's it. And so, um, so I will uh, let Rachel take it from here. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm excited to join everybody today. You're gonna get lots of tips and tools, whether you are a small shop, or a sophisticated organization. There's a lot that um, you're going to learn today. So this is kind of our agenda. I'm going to talk with you guys about building a portfolio of donors, how to prioritize them. And then I'm going to show you some great tools that you can use to prioritize your donors. Surveys and letters and videos and stuff that's old school and stuff that's new school as well. And then we've, I've reserved a little bit of time at the end for Q&A. So we will kick things off. And I like to start by um, when people ask me about, gosh, you know, so many donors, so little time, where do I start? I like to coach people to start with who's already giving to you. So start by shopping in your own closet. That's why this, this slide has a, a picture of somebody's closet. The best way to start with building your portfolio is not to start by going out and prospecting, but start with the donors that you already have in your files. So, I've got some simple tools, just a kind of quick and dirty uh, four-step process. This is pretty old school. This is just you. This doesn't involve, it's super nice to have uh, wealth overlays and predictive modeling, but this is just kind of starting with the basics of you running and pulling a list from your file of who your current donors are. So now, again, I want to stress, I, I love that John kicks this off with, hey, Rachel's been on Oprah. So uh, asking Oprah, Oprah is not a fundraising strategy. I want you to start with the donors that are already giving to you as opposed to the new donors that you'd like to have giving with you. Start with the donors you already have first. And with those donors that you already have, you can just pull a list. And you want to be looking at who's giving you the most, who's the most loyal to you over time, who's been upgrading their giving. I would recommend pulling a list and looking at the last three years. Um, if you've got the last five years, that's nice too, but look at the last three years uh, to start. You want to pick a cumulative amount when you're pulling this list. So you might have a donor, maybe your organization considers a major gift $5,000. And if you just pulled a list of donors who've given $5,000 and up, you might miss donors who had been giving to you maybe through monthly giving and through a year-end gift whose total giving added up to be $5,000. So that's why I caution you to pick a cumulative amount. Don't pick a single gift amount. 
but pick a cumulative amount. It is nice if you have uh, the budget and resources to screen for capacity, but not everybody does. If you do do a wealth overlay, I encourage you to not take it to, I mean, it, it's, it's a nice information to have, and it often can reveal wealth and capacity about donors that you might not have known before. However, on the flip side of that, if you have a donor who you know has um, great wealth and they show up on a wealth screen uh, as poor as a church mouse, just know that um, that, pe that, it, that people are intelligent, especially wealthy people, and they might have, um, d you know, hidden many of their assets, and that's why it's not showing up. So, uh, so it's nice to have, but um, but it, you might have insight into your donors um, that are that are valuable, and so be aware of that, especially if you've got a donor who you know has a lot of capacity, but that isn't showing up as such in your screen. And then the last point is to look at their behavioral data. This is information that most organizations have and aren't mining to their full capabilities. So I encourage you to look at their behavioral data. What events are they going to that you're hosting? Are they bringing their friends? Are they volunteering? How are they interacting with you? Are they opening up your newsletter? Um, what are they clicking on? So e examine their, you know, are they, are they sharing your content? Look at their behavioral data, and I'm going to show you some neat video tools that can give you some insight into that as well. But that's kind of like a, a fast um, thing of what to start with. Now, when we talk about prioritizing a portfolio, I like to talk about it in terms of, of the word qualification. So a qualification means uh, this donor of all of my all the donors in the universe in my file I've prioritized and qualified that these are the donors I should be focusing my time on these are the donors that you want to determine if I gave these donors more love and attention they would respond to me and want to want to have more care and feeding from a fundraiser from a gift officer so the people that you're trying to determine would they respond to more care and feeding from you are donors that you don't know, maybe they're new to you, donors that you think that you can upgrade. You think, you know, if I just gave them more attention, if I just had more face-to-face -face visits with them, if I gave them the tour, I think they could be giving more. Or conversely, donors who you think you should downgrade. Maybe you've got some donors that you've been trying to get visits with and they just haven't been responsive and you're wondering, gosh, is this, just should, should I be prioritizing this donor or does this donor just are they just going to make a year and gift, and do they just belong in my annual fund? So these are this is kind of the potential universe of donors who you might be trying to prioritize. Now, if you're new, my advice is play the new card as long as you possibly can because it's a great excuse for you to get your donors to open up to you and tell you things that you don't know about them, and then you know be intelligent about it and save it all in your database or CRM. So I'm going to walk you through an old school way to qualify your donors. This is completely free. Uh, by the end of this, you might say, well, this is actually more uh, as free as kittens, Rachel. Um, but this is an old school process for you to qualify the donors that you have that you're trying to determine if you could upgrade them. So, um, so we're going to skip to the next slide, and I'm going to walk you through this. So this is how to prioritize donors if you're a small shop and you don't have any resources to invest in video or surveys. So. First off, send them an actual letter. And I'm going to show you a sample of a letter in the next slide. But you're going to send them an actual letter that just lets them know, first off, thank you so much for contributing to us. Every donor has a story. I want to know your story. I'm going to call you to find out more about what inspired you to make, the, make your gift to us. I'd love to visit with you and learn more about you, your interests, and how we can support your interests here in our organization. So it's like you're rolling out the red carpet to your donor, and before you email them and before you pick up the phone, you're going to formalize this by sending them an, a nice letter in the mail. So first they get the letter, then you're going to call them, then you're going to email them. This could easily take you seven to ten tries. People are busy. It's hard to get them on the phone. It's hard to get a visit with them. Um, if they don't respond at all to after seven to ten tries, then you're going to send them a letter and just let them know, I've reached out to you, I haven't heard from you, I've called you, I've emailed you, I'm always here, I'd love to learn more about how we can tell you more about how your gifts are making a difference. <clears throat> um, if you could just fill out these couple of questions on this self-addressed stamped postcard back to us, I'd love to hear from you. 
if they still don't respond to that, you can send them a final note and just let them know that you tried reaching out to them, you haven't heard from them, you're always here, you're always available. If they'd like to speak with you, you only want to contact them and just tell them more about how their gifts are making a difference at your organization. So now I'm going to show you an example of what this could look like in an actual letter. So basically the first thing this pre-call letter says is thank you. And then the second thing is every donor has a story. I want to know yours. I want to know what you need from us and just tell you how you're making a difference. And in this particular letter, this, this gift officer identifies that they report directly to the leadership. You can personalize this based on, you know, your culture within your organization. So if you're feeling like um, this guy in this next slide right here, if you're feeling like, oh my gosh, that's a whole lot of letters and that's a lot of calls, you can also use video. Now, uh, John and I have this video up. You'll get to see this video a little bit later. Um, but this is a great video that our friends at Operation Smile did. And, and just to give you a little summary of this video, we didn't have enough time in the coffee break to play it, but you will get to see this later. And just to kind of summarize this video, this is a great video that introduces the organization and the CEO and leadership in this video says, we want to hear from you. We, we respect your privacy, but we'd love to hear from you. We want to hear your thoughts. We want to hear your feedback. We want to hear your ideas. If you'd like to visit with us, if you'd like for someone to contact you so that we can visit with you and learn more about your ideas, please click yes on this form. So it's basically putting a ball in the donor's court. It's an emotional, you know, just really moving tribute to the organization and the important work that they do, the great work they do at Operation Smile, and that it invites people to end. If you'd like to learn more, we'd love to tell you more. We want, we want to tell you about how you're making a difference, but we respect your privacy. If you'd like us to contact you, please click on this form. So it's giving the donor an opportunity to raise their hand, and this is a really important part of your donors giving you permission and saying, yeah, I want to learn more. So I'm going to show you in this next slide kind of an anatomy of what this looks like in like a flow chart. The video, it can be, it can get sent in an email and they click on the link to watch the video or it can also be sent in a postcard and they type it in, they go and they watch the video. Some people will raise their hand and say, yeah, I want to have a visit. Other people will watch the video but not say that they want to have a visit. Other people might watch part of the video. All of these interactions with you are micro engagements and that your donor or prospect has made for having a deeper relationship. So obviously anyone who raises their hand and says, yeah, I want to have a visit, those are people that you're actually going to call, you're actually going to try to book a visit with them. The other people might respond well to a welcome series. So that's a great example of how you can use video. If you've got the resources, how you can use video. This is all done um, using personalized URLs. So that allows you to track when they, you know, who opened it, if they forwarded it, how long they watched it, and, and all of their interactions while they watched it. I've got another tool. I, I just love how John always shares so many great tools and resources for guests on um, Hump Day Coffee Break. So I'm going to skip to this next slide and show you guys another great tool. This is a tool that I just started using, and I'm a big fan of it. I don't work for this company. I don't get referrals from this company. But I think this is a great, very inexpensive, affordable tools for fundraisers to use to manage their portfolio. And it, this, it's, the company is called BombBomb.com, and you can basically send short videos to people. Um, just you know, you can use your smartphone to do it. You can use your webcam on your computer. And it's a neat way to send out using video email. It's, it's basically the tool is just video email. And I use it um, to communicate with people that uh, hire me to do trainings. And it's a neat way for them to see me and get to know me. And I think this is a great tool for you to use with your donors, especially when it's hard for you to get your foot in the door and get a lot of face time with them. So check that out because that's a neat tool as well. The other neat thing about that tool is just like in the video that I shared, you get to see um, when they opened it and when they watched it. And that's nice as well. You know, you know that if someone watched your video five times, they're probably going to visit with you and have coffee or lunch. And if they didn't watch it at all, you can kind of get a sense of what their appetite is for deepening their relationship with you. So that's a, that's a neat tool. And this is a great spreadsheet that I want to share with you guys. This is just kind of showing you 
if you had a portfolio of donors, how you could kind of keep that portfolio of donors organized. Um, you know, I, I mentioned doing the pu pulling your list of what they had given to you previously. And in this, this is just an Excel spreadsheet. In this spreadsheet, you've got your cast of, of, of peanuts, um, and if, as if you were cultivating them as donors, and you've got what they gave last year, what your goal is for them this year, some kind of prioritization, a little bit about their interests, and then you've got your goals of how you're going to steward them and when you're going to do an ask and what you're going to do an ask for. So my tip on prioritizing upgrading donors is have a cultivation plan and a revenue goal for every donor in your portfolio. If you take away one thing in your notes today, I want it to be that you have a set a revenue goal for every donor in your portfolio. Not only is it does it help you reach your goals as a fundraiser, but it also helps you in the event that your boss comes to you and says, oh, you know, gosh, we've had a tough year this year. I need you to go out and raise $150,000 more. You can look at your plan, you can look at your um, your portfolio of donors and say, you know what, based on everyone's prior giving, based on what I know about them, I don't think that's a realistic goal for us to have this year. What are other ways that we could hit that goal? What are other opportunities for us to look at? So not only does it help you reach your goals, but it also helps you avert disaster in the event that you've got an overambitious um, you know, person in leadership who thinks you can just double or triple your goals. It helps you kind of ground your fundraising in reality. So I encourage you to do that. I've got just a couple more tips I'm going to run through really fast here. Uh, another thing that you can do in person uh, is a donor thought circle. And here's a recipe for that. Um, the recipe for a donor thought circle is really just, if you want to skip to the next slide, it's really just um, having an intimate group in a controlled social setting and giving people an opportunity to be with their peers. You're going to tell people ahead of time, hey, we want to hear your thoughts. We want to hear more about your giving to us. And we're going to invite you to share your thoughts with us. We're going to ask you a few questions and take notes. You want to let them know that you're going to be asking them questions and taking notes so they don't think that aren't surprised by your behavior when you're doing that in person. But you're just going to ask donors a few questions. This is an intimate group. This is maybe like, maybe you have like 20 donors. And you're just asking them more about their giving and what inspired their giving. And we'll skip to the next slide and I can show you a little bit about what are some great questions that you can ask. Asking them, you know, what connected you to us? What made you decide to be a donor? How can we encourage others to give to us? How can we make you feel more special and appreciated? And what things would make people feel more special and appreciated? The reason why there are two questions that relate to that is because Rachel? Hi, sorry, can you hear me okay? Oh yeah, sure. Um, we lost you just for a second okay. there. Yep. And uh, awesome. we were talking sorry about, about we were that. Talking, oh, no problem. We were, you were talking about these questions. That's the last thing that we, we got. Perfect. Perfect. So, um, so yeah, the, the point of these questions and the, the numbers four and five seem similar. And the reason why is because if I asked you in front of your peers who are also donors what I could do to make you feel more special and appreciated, you might not give me the honest answer. But if I asked you what things would make other people feel more special and appreciated, you might be more likely to give me an honest answer in that scenario. So those are some questions for a thought circle. The idea there is that it's an intimate event and it's an opportunity for you to learn more about your donors, what motivates them to give, and what might motivate them to give more. I'm going to show you guys a few slides of a donor survey 
This is from a webinar, a hump day copy break that John and I did on how to do donor surveys to boost revenue. And this is a great example of an online survey. Now, the first thing I want to say about doing a survey like this is it is all about your subject line. Your subject line is what is going to determine whether people open it and take the survey. So put as much thought into a fantastic subject line as you do into your actual questions. But you can see this is um, very great, clean image. This is like a BuzzFeed style quiz, highly visualized. The images, this is a literacy organization, and the images fit in with that really well. So we'll, we'll go ahead and skip to the first question. Hey, the first question is, how are we doing on communication? Too much, just right, not enough? So that's always good to know how your donors are feeling about you communicating with them. The second question is, um, when it comes to literacy, I'm most interested in kids, adults, or families. Now, that's important for this organization because they're serving all of those groups. So when it comes to your programs, you can think about what is a question that I could ask that could help me understand of all of our programs, what are the most important? And then the next question that we have here is where do you want your donations to impact? Books, teachers, or youth mentors? All of these are great things to ask for this organization, and this is going to help them understand what they need to put in their appeals and what their donors are going to respond to and do some really good segmentation. So there's a few things that I would tell you to not ask people in a survey. The first thing <clears throat> is do not ask them when they gave or how much they gave because you already know that information. That information is already in your CRM. Don't ever ask them something that you already know. You want to have a very short, very sweet, highly visualized survey, and you want to be strategic about each question that you answer and not waste your donor's time or your time asking them things that you already know the answer to. So I'm going to tell you guys a couple things and then point you out to a couple resources before we take Q&A. Uh, I want to let you guys know that I do fundraising boot camp classes. I've got one coming up in New York on November 17th. I actually have four spots left if anybody uh, on the call today uh, or listening to it, uh, to the recording, is interested in uh, advancing their fundraising skills. It's fantastic. I've also got a webinar series that launches in January. And it's a four-part webinar series dedicated to major gifts. So you can learn more about both of these things at pursuant.com forward slash training. I've also got a really great resource for everybody that's completely free, and it's a good guide for um, identifying prospects, some tips to reach your best donor prospects. So that's up at um, pursuant.com forward slash 21 tips for anybody on the call who wants to get a, a good cheat sheet on identifying the best prospects to your organization. So we've got about seven minutes left here for questions, uh, if, if uh, anybody wants to um, type any in. Rachel, this is great. Excellent. So this is your time, people. Uh, Rachel is one of the top experts in the world, and she's met Oprah. So, you know, if you ask her a question, you could you could feel like you're at least, uh, you know, two degrees away from Oprah. <laughs> All right. Um, you're hilarious. <laughs> and um, one thing, uh, let's see. Oh, um, I think oh, Sharon is asking, um, I want to get more monthly donors. If I survey, should I ask that as a question? Uh, in other words, um, would you be willing to make a monthly donation? I think we, we, would that be a good survey question? Hmm, that's an interesting one. So, you know, one thing I would tell you would be um, don't ask more than five questions total on a survey like this and have it be highly visualized. I don't know if, um, I, you know, I don't know what your other, you could ask that. I, I think, I don't know what, you're, what you know about your donors what you, or, and what you don't know about your donors. Um, and I would be really strategic with every single question that you ask. Um, I mean, you might, you might, that might be something more for promoting that you have that as an option in other channels, you know, promoting it in your newsletter, promoting it on your website, um, and more of an education tool to get people to know that that is an option for them, or even, you know, doing like a, 
like a light box on your screen uh, on your home page um, to let them know and promoting monthly giving in your donation form. I might lean more towards those avenues than actually asking that because I, I, I just don't know how many I think I think you might get just as meaningful of a, a response as putting the offer out there as you would about asking people if that's something that they want. That's my instinct. Yeah, I think you're you right. You might have other thoughts. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think um, if you add, it's almost like if you're planning on doing a monthly, um, you know, giving program, asking people if they're going to participate doesn't really matter so much. Um, because you're going to pitch, you're going to have to pitch it anyhow. What if, you know, if, if it's not like if only 30% said yes, you're not going to do it, you know? Um, and yeah. it's, and it's better, I think to your point, Rachel, it's better to ask them when you, you really have one chance. So you don't want to ask them in a survey and then three months later, Hey, that monthly, uh, program you were interested in, here it is because they may lose interest. So I think the moment is really critical. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I would be thinking strategically about what are the things we don't know about our donors that we want to know? What 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 inspired them to make their first gift? What programs are the most important to them? Um, you know, th these are these are things. Um, you know, and be thoughtful about it. Spend a lot of time thinking critically about it and test it out before you launch it to your donors. And like I said earlier, if you don't have a good subject line no one's going to open it and answer it in the first place. So put as much effort into a great subject line as you do into your questions. Mm -hmm. um, the best open rate I ever saw on a survey, the subject line was, who are you, question mark. And it was a disease organization, and they were trying to identify if their donors were caregivers or parents or patients or, you know, just who who their these people were on their file. Um, they had a phenomenally high response rate to that. Um, and I, I typically, I haven't seen anything as high since then, but you definitely want to be strategic with your, with your subject line. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I'll just add about the surveys is that it might be good to do a survey after you do a donor uh, thought circle, you know, because then that, that thought circle is going yeah. to help you refine a lot of the thing a, a lot of the questions that you might ask in a, in the circle but i love how this example um really drills into the interest are they interested in helping families and children adults or and then also within that what programs books um you know i want my donation to impact books teachers and youth mentors you know so you can really refine your actually your, your follow-up messaging too so even the people that take the survey if they say that they're interested in having their donation impact books and they want to have that um, um, they're most interested in children. So then you'll have an email that's about children and the books they read and how that's changing their lives and having those messages, you know, follow following up as a way to follow up the survey in some ways, you know? Um, yeah, so, absolutely. So a couple more questions here. Um, Deborah's asking, oh, one, one person's asking any tools you would rec recommend besides survey monkey. That's a tools question. Uh, the bomb bomb one that I showed earlier, the video email is a great tool. That mm -hmm. template of the major gift portfolio, that's just an Excel. That's, mm -hmm. and you know, you can totally, I mean, well, I know lots of people on the call might have sophisticated CRMs. Some people on the call from smaller organizations might not have a sophisticated CRM. Mm. Even if you ha you might have a sophisticated CRM and you've got dirty data. Um, one thing, I, I, I show people just an Excel spreadsheet because everyone has Excel. Mm. And, you know, and I, and I tell people, you know, you can at least kind of, um, you can think about that screenshot of the template as, this is my plan. I'm going to update what I'm doing with my donors and my CRM, but my plan is just, you know, just like you, you might write down your goals in Excel or on a Word document. This is my plan of where I want to go this year. And then it, you can automatically have it sort and total, and it can kind of give you an idea of like, okay, here's how far I am year to date. You know, you're updating your, your CRM of record with visits that you have, but it can be nice to put something like that in the Excel spreadsheet just 
when you're planning out your goals for the year. Okay. Um, and then Deborah has a question about in-kind and um, in-kind donations and time, you know, volunteering. Mm -hmm. um, how to ask that. Would you, would you include that in the similar um, sort of research or was that as a separate track? In-kind donations and volunteering. Yeah, there's when I was, you mean when I'm when you're looking at like kind of like the behavioral data of how your donor is interacting with you. Yeah, and also the sur maybe the survey as well. The the question is, how do you consider in kind and time as a, or do you consider in kind and time as a donation? You know, I used to book at Girl Start. I booked in kind donations in my budget. You know, as like as like for example, like in kind media as a revenue and as an expense. Um, but I would I would use it to inform you in terms of just the level of commitment that your donor has to your organization. Mm. And um, I, would, I would use it in that capacity. Awesome. <clears throat> so thank you so much again, Rachel. You are a rock star. You're a total hit with this group. Everybody loves this. And uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Look for the recording in the newsletter next week. And Rachel, do you want to um, add any final thoughts or encouragement or anything like that? Oh, um, it was really just great to get to spend time with you guys. I know it gave you lots of information. Hopefully, um, hopefully you can use some of these things to help you take your fundraising to the next level. Thanks a lot. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you, everybody else. Talk to you soon. Bye.